Welcome to Life Happens, where Texans come to protect their legacy and prepare for the second half of life. Join your host, attorney Kim Hegwood of Your Legacy Legal Care and our weekly guest as we navigate the challenges that emerge as life happens. Now here's your host, Kim Hegwood. Good morning and welcome to Life Happens with me, Kim Hegwood, and our very special guest today is Kate DeBartolo, and she's with the Conversation Project. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, today we're going to be talking about challenging conversations with seniors, and um, for any of you that have had trouble talking to your parents about stuff, this is something you want to hear. So, and uh, so let's kind of get this ball rolling a little bit by giving our listeners some information on how did this start? I mean, what, how did, how did you, the conversation project become in being? Yeah, so we started about 10 or 12 years ago um, based on Ellen Goodman's experience. Ellen was a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. She had talked about a lot of things in life with her sister, with her mother, but they had not talked about what they would want for care through the end of their lives. And she was left with a lot of questions and feeling not great about the experience. Talked to a bunch of peers and realized there seemed to be a difference between people who had had conversations before the loss of somebody important in their life and those who had not. And that those who had talked about it, you know, they could still grieve the loss of their person, but it wasn't quite as complicated or complex grief. They were still talking to their siblings. They weren't second guessing themselves. She brought the idea to IHI, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, who agreed that this was an important concept to create a public engagement initiative to help people realize that they can have these conversations at the kitchen table, not just in the ICU, you know, that a crisis can be a really hard time to learn. And the more we can normalize this for people early and often, um, we have no preference for the type of care somebody would want, but we wanted to... uh, get the word out there to people that they can have these conversations and provide a bunch of free resources to make it easier for them to kind of break the ice and know what to talk about. We sometimes joke that it could have been the conversations project because it's not only one one opportunity to sit down and talk about it. You may break this into little bite-sized pieces over time, but just helping people realize that this isn't only a medical or a legal conversation. This is about life and how you want to live your life through the end. So that's the goal for us. Well, that's an excellent goal. And uh, I tell lots of people, you know, my grandparents had a longtime attorney that did wills for them and nothing else. So here I am fresh out of law school, you know, just getting my practice started and went, oh, wait, y'all don't have power of attorneys. Mm -hmm. uh, My grandfather looked at those. I drafted them and everything, took them to him. My grandfather looked at them and slid them across the table and said, I don't need this because his longtime attorney didn't give it to him, you know. And uh, so, um, so yes, it was very difficult. And, uh, you know, initially the only conversation we had was we want to stay at home and that was it, nothing else. And so it's very difficult when you have very little instructions, you kind of have to fly by the seat of your pants sometimes. (laughs) And that's not a fun way to do it at all. And it's helpful too for people to realize they can have a say in their care, their clinicians want to know, people in their life want to know what matters. And rather than leaving it up to chance or for somebody else to make that decision, if we know what matters most to you, we can make a lot of decisions based on that. So for us, it's really about getting people to talk about their values and what matters most to them. It's not just about medical hypothetical scenarios. For me, it's about quality of life. Mm -hmm. How do you want that quality of life to be if you can't make the decisions anymore? How do you want it to be? What do you want it to look like? You know, and if you can't have this particular scenario, what's your second option? Because sometimes, you know, plan A doesn't work. So maybe we have to go to plan B or plan C, you know. So we try in our office to talk, you know, get them, get the conversation going. Sometimes it's a little harder than you'd like. And so I I know that this is about conversations with seniors, but we really see it for anybody over age 18. Mm -hmm. Somebody's moving out of town, moving out of the house, like something unexpected could happen where you're going to be okay, but there's a, there's a period of time where somebody else has to make some decisions. So that's been the other thing for us is really normalizing this across all different ages. I think the age group that we're talking about is different though than the younger generation, because my granddaughter, who's only 11, just told me the other day that her daddy wants to be cremated. So I don't know how that conversation, I'm like, oh, I'm not so sure. Yeah. 
That's what that's what he wanted. And she knew much that. more you know, normalized like, for wow. younger folks. Yeah, yeah, how did that conversation start? You know. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so you know, it's always helpful to, you know, to get people talking about things early and as things change, maybe adjusting the conversation while they still can. And yeah. um, I think it's really important though. But for caregivers helping someone with dementia, are there additional suggestions? Because we're finding a lot of clients are getting diagnosed with some type of dementia. So they're gonna need care longer. Yeah, um, we're seeing this come up all over the country. And I think this hits home again, the reason to have these conversations as early as possible. So to normalize this again, before there's a diagnosis, but then once there is, um, to realize that there's different stages of dementia and the way you could have a conversation, we have a free tool for, for caregivers of somebody with dementia. If somebody's early in their progression of their disease, you likely can still talk to them about some of the questions that come up. Um, it may not be, again, one big sit down experience that's very long. Um, if somebody's maybe in the middle stages of dementia, you may have some good moments where you could ask one or two questions. So really thinking about what are the things that I most want to prioritize talking to them about. Um, and to be willing to take that opportunity if there's they're kind of present with you and able to talk about that. And then if somebody's further along, we often will invite people to think through some of the questions that we have. You know, are you concerned about receiving too much treatment or too little? Or if you were to be sick with another illness, how what kind of treatment would you want? And to think about how would mom have answered these questions? Not how do I wish she would have answered them or what would I want in this situation, but knowing how you know, she lived her life, what, um, how do I think she would answer this? Or can I pull people in who've known this person well, and we all can sit around and talk about it and come communally to an agreement about that. I think it's really important too for caregivers to realize that sometimes we'll hear from people like, I don't want to upset my person, or is this trying to be, is this cruel to be bringing it up, or they're in denial about their memory problems. And I think it's important for people to realize that the changes in the brain that are happening because of dementia doesn't make denial the same as it may be for somebody who's not experiencing those changes. They are not able to comprehend the differences that we're able to see and that this is truly a kindness. This is not about trying to be cruel to somebody. It is about being in service of them, wanting to honor them, respect them, do well by them. And so it doesn't have to be a big, long, drawn out process that's really unpleasant, but trying to find out, you know, who would this person want to make decisions on their behalf if they haven't already identified that? So let's pick a person. And what are some of the key values about how you want to live your life? Um, maybe we could kind of focus in on those scenarios, um, but helping people really feel like there's many other caregivers in that same situation and, and asking peers, how has it gone? Um, I remember hearing a story from someone about how for her mother, who was in a, a more advanced stage of dementia, seeing birds out of her window and grandchildren visiting was, she was living a very content life. She was very happy. And she was like, I never would have thought to put into writing. My, my mom must have a window by her bed or like grandkids, as long as grandkids are visiting or she's in that ability. But I don't want her moved to a room that's looking out at a parking lot and she can't see her birds. But thinking about what is it that makes life, like what, what's a good day look like for this person um, and being able to make some decisions based on that. So you're going to get people that don't want to talk about it, like my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And so, so what are some tips? Because, you know, at the time I didn't do it well. I just let it go. Um, you know, four years later, you know, the paperwork said on the uh, microwave cart, uh, yeah. Four years later, he had a stroke taking care of my grandmother, you know, and so then it was, it was a little more brutal having our conversation because I gave him a come to Jesus speech in the uh, hospital room over who was going to be making decisions and things like that. Yeah. You know, So he was more receptive at that point in time. And, and uh, I wish he'd have been better, you know, receptive at first. But what are some tips that, you know, what, what can you do to kind of help people, you know, even when they don't want to talk about it? So maybe it's an early diagnosis and you're bringing it up or, you know, or just, you know, midway, just anything that could help caregivers and family, you know, to kind of get through this. Yeah. So I think that breaking things into little bite-sized pieces helps using current events, you know, oh, President Jimmy Carter's been on hospice for the last 12 months and there's an opening. Or, you know, the series finale of the TV show, This Is Us, had some of these conversations. But there can sometimes be 
a book, a movie, a TV show where it's like, I was thinking about that and it made me realize I'm not sure what you would want in that situation. Or again, really framing things in along the lines of honor and respect and how can I do well by you? Um, being curious and asking questions rather than just telling somebody what you're worried about for them, but kind of some open-ended questions. Um, I also think sometimes I've been hearing from a lot of older adults who are trying to engage their adult children who don't want to hear it. So it kind of depends here who who's not wanting to listen, if that makes sense. And so thinking about sometimes if, if you've got uh, information you want to share and people aren't wanting to hear what you have to say, saying, all right, well, I'm going to pop it in an email. I'm going to tell you where these files are. I want you to know about it now. We don't have to sit down and talk about all of it, but here's the thing. I want you to star it in your inbox. So if you ever had to pull it up in the hospital, you could. Telling other people. I know my mom was one of seven and she was the decision maker for both of her parents. And the other six kids like, were all on the same page. They weren't second guessing her and swooping in last minute because it was understood who the decision maker was going to be. Um, and I remember a woman saying, you know, I, I'm married to my husband. I've, we've done all this. I'm his healthcare decision maker, but he hasn't, I'm his second wife and he hasn't told his adult children that it's me. And I realized that all he, we, it could prevent world war three. All he has to do is say, Hey guys, wanted you to know Barbara and I have done this. He doesn't need to explain all of his wishes to them because they might not be open to it, but even just letting them know who he's designated can make a really big difference. Most definitely. And so I had a client that was like, I've been trying to discuss this with my children and they don't seem to be receptive. I'm like, you get them all in a room and use your mom voice. She started laughing. Use yeah. your mom. You're going to listen because I have something to say and you're just going to listen. So just, I don't care how you feel about it. You're just going to listen, you know? So, and sometimes, I, you know, I remember somebody of- saying that her <laughs> husband reminded her of Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, kind of like mopey around this topic, didn't want to talk about it. And so she found it was easier to frame things as yes, no questions to him rather than assuming a big, long conversation. But it made her feel much better to know know, if something happened, is it correct that you would want me to be your decision maker? Yes. Okay, good. I'll deal with the paperwork on that. Um, And if something happened, this is what I think you would want. Does that sound right? He's able to say, yeah, and had one thing that he would change. But that was a much easier way. So really thinking about who you are trying to approach and how are they going to want to receive this information um, can be really helpful. Definitely. So how does the concept of autonomy come up in conversations? You know, are there common responses? Yeah, I think this idea of autonomy and wanting to have a say in our care is not universal. There's a lot of different cultural dynamics that play in there. I remember seeing... um, There's a book and a blog post written by Katie Butler. She wrote for us of the experience of her parents having dementia. And she has like a 20 bullet point list for her future decision makers on this is exactly what I want you to do. I want you to go exactly by this list. Do not, you know, stray away. Like she really cares about people following what she said, no matter what. And then other people want folks to do what makes them feel good in the moment. So there was a woman in Las Vegas was looking at some of our materials and thinking about it. She's like, I really don't care about any of this. I just want my kids to do what makes them feel good in the moment. But then that's the conversation she needs to have with her children. Because otherwise, she's just not talking about it at all. When really what she's trying to say is, I want you two to be on the same page and do what makes you feel good. Um, So not assuming that for everybody, it's like having a say is the most important part. For some people, it's I want the whole family involved or I want, you know, there's, there's cultural dynamics of the oldest children or reaching out to family. Um, So I think that's really important to keep in mind. And, and for a lot of solo agers, that's a really growing demographic of older adults who don't have um, currently like a spouse or adult children or to feel like there's a, an automatic decision maker for them. Um, Really, I think that's where such a, the legal documentation, the medical documentation can be really important, making sure that's on file, finding out within your state, like who could be designated as your proxy. We've seen a lot of congregations starting to pair people up um, of you know two solo agers who don't have somebody. Would you be willing to play that role for each other? Because if autonomy is important or if there's somebody in your life you do not want involved in your care and you wanna make that very clear, really important to get the documentation in place then. 
we do a lot of trust planning for our solo agers and um, with corporate trustees because they put things like, you know, care managers in place and care advocates and things, you know, they put all those things in place to make sure you're there you know, clients are taken care of. So I really like that, you know, as far as being helpful. And a lot of times the clients just have really like best friends, you know, that yeah. will make the decisions and they do it for yeah. each other. So that works out. So how should yeah. people think about the type of care they want to receive? You know, I think it's really important that people have these conversations and give current answers. Like with your current body and state of mind and life, like what would you want if something unexpected happened right now? not so many hypotheticals. I don't know if I'm going to be in an accident or if it's cancer, or if I'm it's like right now, what would you want? Um, we often hear, you were talking about the idea of being at home. And that's one that I would really encourage people to unpack a little bit. I remember a woman at an event in Florida just saying, you know, my grandmother, the only thing she wanted was to die at home and her dementia got so bad that we couldn't do it. You know, medically it was unfeasible or financially it's not feasible or I live in a fifth floor walk up. There's a lot of reasons why home may not work. And, but to find out what it is about home. Is it, I want a private room. I want home cooked meals. For my grandmother, it was her cat. If her cat could be with her, she didn't care where she was going. But that was the that was the deal breaker. If you want family to visit, you want yeah your art up on the walls. But so finding out what is it about home that's important for people. And then if there's um, ever anybody who's like, if I ever get like that, pull the plug or give me the whole enchilada. Like they're trying to show that they're on one end of the spectrum or the other about uh, how much intervention, you know, for more time, you're talking about quality of life, but you know, for the opportunity for more time, what would you be willing to go through to get that time? I think of back to a colleague who has gotten this down to basically one sentence with her husband, who's her healthcare proxy. They've got two teenage daughters and it's something to the effect of, you know, if I could emotionally and intellectually parent our children, I'm in. If something happens where I can understand, but I can understand what's going on in their day, I could help them with their homework or with their friends. And I have a lot of physical limitations from that. I don't, I don't mind the physical limitations. I want to be there to parent them. But if what happens means that I would not be able to contribute to their lives in that way, I don't need you to take extreme measures. That one sentence about her values and what matters, her husband could handle almost every medical scenario that comes his way by being able to ask the clinicians for their prognosis or their understanding of what her recovery could look like. And she's very healthy right now. You know, this is if something unexpected or catastrophic occurred. Um, so thinking about like, what's that what makes life worth living? What's a good day to you? I, you know, we hear people say, if I can eat chocolate ice cream and watch college football, I'm in. Like, I would want you to do what it takes. But but if I can't do that or if I can't, you know, for my dad, it's get on the tractor or walk the dogs or, you know, he's got people have what their sense of autonomy looks like for them. Um, so I found those to be helpful examples. Have you seen conversations go when someone is hoping for a miracle? Yeah, this comes up a lot where folks say, I don't want to give up hope or I don't want, I want to be alongside my person praying for a miracle or hoping for a miracle. And I loved, there's a quote of, you know, early on, we're hoping for a cure and as much good time as possible. And then over time, it's kind of relief from suffering or a death of dignity. So thinking about what are we hoping for over time? And this phrasing, there's a physician, Dr. Sunita Puri, who had a great framing of, you know, part of doing everything, especially if somebody says, I, I want to do everything. I'm a fighter, um, you know, hoping for a miracle here is, you know, part of doing everything for you is understanding that, you know, if there's a time where you couldn't speak for yourself, what would you want me to know? You know, what are you fighting for? What does doing everything look like? What does a miracle look like for you? I remember a, a gentleman in Boston, he was in his nineties. He had a lot of health issues his original plan is he did not want a lot of medical intervention taken. His doctors knew that he had plans drawn up that way. And then he was admitted to the hospital with full ICU care. He was getting everything, you know, the whole enchilada. And his doctor was rounding him. just like, Mr. Brown, what's going on? I thought we had a plan. And he said, yes, but my first great grandchild was due in two weeks and I will do everything I can to be there to meet that baby. And then we can go back to the original plan. And I think that's so important again of, asking questions or understanding what is behind this desire. People's wishes can change. There's reasons, you know, there's a wedding, there's a graduation, there's something I really want to make it to. So understanding that, but then also 
asking people like, what has this experience been like for you? What has surgery been like for you? Giving people a little bit of an opening that if they have been rah, rah, I'm doing everything. And it feels like things are getting a little harder to kind of give some openings for that. And I just love the shift of framing of rather than seeing it as giving up on someone, it is letting go. We know that mortality rates are holding steady at 100%. You know, like this is a universal um, thing for all of us. But just like birth, death doesn't have to be a very medical experience. It's a human experience. Yeah. And to acknowledge, uh, you know, this framing of you know, your father is a strong man. It's his body that is struggling and helping separate from people this idea of a fighter or a strong person, or they would want to do everything. Like that's the person, but their body is telling us something different at this point. And that giving that permission to go there can be really helpful for people. Yeah. So this has been phenomenal. Kate, I can't tell you how good this has been. If somebody wants to get in touch with y'all, how do they do that? I would say to check out the conversationproject.org. We have free resources, tons of conversation starter guides in multiple languages. Um, so conversationproject.org. We're also on social media. And my email is kdebartolo, K-D-E-B-A-R-T-O-L-O at IHI.org. We'd love to help answer questions people have. Perfect. Thanks so much. And we look forward to having you again on the show soon. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Life Happens with Kim Hegwood. Be sure to tune in every Thursday at 10 a.m. wherever you listen to your podcasts as we navigate through the challenges that emerge as life happens. The content of this podcast does not establish an attorney-client relationship or constitute attorney-client privilege, legal, medical, financial, or any other professional advice.